to the Talkhorn Book Talk. I'm Nick Burgess, the books columnist for the Iowan Magazine, and with me, as always, is Steve Semkin of Ice Cube Press. How are you doing today, Steve? I'm not bad. Great. It's fun to come in here and see you every few months. So what books, uh, what do you want to talk about book recommendation-wise today? Uh, you know what happens as a publisher? I guess you'll never, you'll probably never guess what happens the most. People want to know if they can get their book done, pub if they can get their book published by me. So, um, I don't really mind that question because, of course, I want everyone to write, but I always have the feeling I should tell them something that they can do other than send me their book in the mail. Okay. And so I thought today I would share just three books that over time it helped me become a writer and I've found other people to like them. And there's this one, I won't go into them a lot because if okay. you're into writing, then you can look it up. That's part of the writing process is to investigate and look into yeah. things. But one of them I always liked was um, The Triggering Town by okay. Richard Hugo. And it's real, um, like, he does some stereotypical stuff where he talks about how he likes to have a hundred number two pencils perfectly sharpened. So some of the advice is a little <laughs> sure. bit weird, but on the other hand, it makes yeah. you feel like anything that you do to become a writer is, yeah. is fine if you want to work that out. Um, there's another one called If You Want to Write, which is a real, it's a pretty much of a classic. It's been around for a sure. long time. And, you know, a book about independence and spirit. So it's about Perfect. creativity and wanting to be a writer. And then this one is a real classic one, too. I'm not up to date on what it takes to be a writer now because mm -hmm. I'm ancient. I'll be getting my AARP card any, any day now, actually. I think I've got a few years. <laughs> but this one's called Writing Down the Bones, and okay. it kind of guides you through um, writing activities. Mm -hmm. So it's a real hands-on approach. To, if you just want to get started and don't know where to get started, just grab onto Writing Down the Bones and have your first shot at being a writer. Yeah, you know, you mentioned like the hundred uh, number two pencils perfectly sharpened. It strikes yeah. me that uh, oftentimes writers are just as superstitious as athletes and like they have their things and they want them just so. And whether right. or not that's, you know, I can't write if, if I have any sort of right. like noise going on. But, right. you know, you, you do sort of need to get over that, I think. Right, well, there's a certain, I mean, some people are their own worst enemies. They're no. like, I'm going to write a novel. <laughs> Yeah. And then they put so many obstacles in front of themselves yeah. that they probably never get around to doing yeah. it. But I think on the other hand, it's good to realize there's no one way to do it. Yeah. Right. So, so, what, uh, so what books do you have coming out uh, on Ice Cube Press uh, Oh, 2012 future? is here, right? So yeah. that means it's all new books. Yeah. So all the old authors are like, well, I'm not, what happened to my books? But I still worry about the last books too. But um, this year, I'll just, I have six coming out this year. Okay. And the first one, these are all galleys, so... Um, if you're looking at them on a film, when you get your copy, when this one comes out in April, it won't have this sticker on the <laughs> cover anymore. But um, there's one by Larry Baker coming out called Love and Other Delu uh, um, Delusions. Okay. And it's uh, kind of a romance twist on an older, um, younger guy meets an older woman and things go from there. Um, this one is called Their Time of Learning. Okay. And she is um, a Native American from up around the Great Lakes area. And she's really into plant um, medicine, and so what plants can do in the Midwest. Because a lot of times um, people will see an oak tree, and that's pretty good. But what can it, I mean, there's a tradition that goes into that. And so yeah. this is a novel that um, explains how that's integrated into the um, people of the Great Lakes lifestyle. And so it's kind of a coming of age young uh, girl novel with lots of um, spirit medicine and plant stuff involved in it as well. Cool. Um, then in July, there's this book called The Divorce Girl, which is a novel, and we, it's subtitled The Story of, of Art and Soul. And a lot of people get divorced, and that's not that unusual, but this one has got a lot of twist on um, how her life changed when her parents got divorced. And um, it's funny and sad and inspiring all at once. And so, you know, in July, we'll probably talk more about this one. Very cool. There are things happening out there. <laughs> well, great. So let's welcome uh, Colleen Bradford Krantz. She was a uh, journalist who worked for the uh, St. Louis Post-Dispatch, uh, the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, and most recently the Des Moines Register. Yeah, that's right. Uh, fantastic. So will you start with a little bit about what Train to Nowhere is, is about? Well, uh, many people in Iowa will, will probably remember when in 2002 a grain elevator worker in, in Denison, Iowa opened a rail car uh, as they were preparing to load a train with corn and found 11 bodies inside. And uh, the book is basically the telling of how they ended up inside this rail car, uh, which was locked, 
and and the story of the subsequent criminal investigation, um, search for the smugglers, and 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 the effects on the families, and so on. So, in your research process, sort of what, how did that go? Who did you have to talk to to sort of build this story? I started with a lot of government sources, you know, um, requesting documents. Um, usually, I had an easy time, but there were some times where I had to fight a battle to try to get documents mm -hmm. because technically the case was still ongoing. Mm -hmm. Um, but from there, I, I would comb those documents looking for um, names I hadn't found yet, um, contact information, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and gradually started building around those people I found and, and their stories of how this um, played out in their lives. So uh, this, uh, this happened almost 10 years ago. Uh, how long, when did you get interested in, in researching this and how long, how long did it take you to sort of build, build the whole uh, case file, for lack of a better word? I really started after I left the Des Moines Register and uh, was working on my own. Uh, it was probably around 2006 mm -hmm. and, and really was chiseling away at it very slowly. I had young children and mm -hmm. would fit it in as I could. And, um, and you know, it was really um, 2009 before I think Steve and I started talking um, and, uh, and then the book happened. Yeah. In the meantime, we did, um, I didn't know if the book would happen for sure, so we'd actually done a documentary as well. Yeah, talk a little bit about the process of, of, of doing a documentary, uh, a film along with along with the book. It was a it was a really new thing for me. I'd always been in uh, writing and newspapers, and and all of a sudden I'm looking at this idea of jumping to documentaries, and I I worried that transitioning to that format would be difficult. But because I'd already done almost all the research for the book and had started writing the book. Mm -hmm. um, it, it surprised me how easily a story can transition. Mm -hmm. um, I had to learn a few techniques and think more visually, but um, but I was surprised, you know, how much this. I mean, if a story's there, it can jump mediums relatively well. Yeah. So, what attracted you to the story? When I heard about it after it happened, I remember feeling like uh, as much media coverage as there was mm -hmm. um, in Iowa and nationally, I still felt like I don't know those people in the rail car. I don't know what happened afterward. Um, what prompted each person to try to come? Uh, it, it was really those questions that drew me in initially, and even some of the science, like what mm -hmm. can science tell us about what happened when they were locked inside their rail car. Um, there were no survivors, so that's all we had to go on. Yeah. But as I went along, it was really the um, people who are still around, the families rel or the relatives of some of those who died, and uh, some of the government folks who were involved that sort of kept me interested mm -hmm. in this story. So when you were talking with, with some of the victims' families, what what uh, what did you learn about sort of what attracts people to do clearly very take a very dangerous journey to to come to the U.S. to, to work? I think the the most common thing you'd hear is what you would guess that there there's um, struggles at home, um, mostly financial. You know they they are struggling to pay bills to feed them feed their families have decent housing. Um, that was clearly the majority, and yeah. and they had seen. What you, what you see happening is they see um, neighbors coming back, um, maybe a, one of them has gone to the United States mm -hmm. and coming back to their home countries and, or sending money back and um, they're looking at their neighbors and how well they're doing so they feel like, I need to do this um, even if I'm breaking the law. Um, it, I did tell the story in particular of a boy from Guatemala who uh, was really following his older brother. They, his older brother had sort of taken care of their financial needs so that wasn't, um, really what prompted him as much as sort of a, a, a teenage typical desire to see the world and, and to um, get to have his own chance to make his own money. Yes. <clears throat> While you're talking about the, them traveling, um, taking the immigration trail, I know when I read it, one thing that really surprised me about the book was that um, from Guatemala to Mexico, that that was actually um, an equivalent um, journey in and of itself to get through Mexico or into Mexico. And I don't, I mean, did you know that sort of thing before? You know, there's a, I, I felt like I learned more about it. It's, um, and it's, and especially how dangerous it is on that yeah. border between Guatemala and Mexico. Right. I, guess um, I just hadn't thought of that. Yeah, I had. I think I read. Uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the book. Um, there, there's a book by Los Angeles uh, Times reporter, and I can't think of the name of it now. But it, it really goes into that journey from through that border region. And if it wasn't for that, I wouldn't really known much about it. But, right. but doing this reporting also, you know. Uh, taught me more about really that's that's the most dangerous part of the journey for Central Americans is getting into Mexico first of all oh, um, getting to the United that. States is I mean compar comparatively is you know easy and or less dangerous anyway yeah, that really surprised me for some reason yeah I, I think I think most people we don't hear about it as much and right and I think most people are less familiar with that um, situation 
because right? we just hear about people from Mexico trying to get over here, but we don't think about yeah. the whole trail. Yeah. So I thought that was pretty good. And I, I mean, I like your part about, I started with them, but one thing led to another. Yeah. And so it was probably hard for you to even figure out when to stop and what to what to include and what not to include, I would guess. Yeah, I remember when we started, um, I worked with a, a video producer from the Quad Cities on the documentary, and I remember him saying, I can't imagine this story being more than a half hour when we put it all together, but there are so many side stories and, um, and details that you can explain, and um, so many parts to this story that I, by the time we were done, you know, he, he felt differently, and it's just, uh, it just, all these different people have so many side stories. And, how is working on, on a book different for you from somebody who's coming from, from newspapers where, you know, a thousand word story, I mean, that's a long newspaper piece. Yeah. Like, how, how is that different for you? How did you have to adapt to, to the new form? Steve probably can talk about this, but I remember, <laughs> I remember feeling like I was clearly having trouble um, sort of, you know, not writing in this short, concise form I'd been writing mm -hmm. in for 10 years, um, get to the point quickly and keep the thing moving. Um, you know, when I was done, I worried, you know, I don't think this is long enough. And, and, and what I had, as I went along, I had to make myself realize it's okay to, to explain how the border works here, even though it's not directly involved in the story. Mm -hmm. um, people are, are going to be willing to follow you along because of, they've committed to this whole book. So, um, so really, that was the hardest thing. And, and you know, I, I worried about staying interested um, for as long as a book takes. But I, I found this story so compelling myself mm -hmm. that I, I didn't have trouble with that. So do you have more books planned? Because this is your first. So, so do you, are you working on, on, on another book, or do you have plans for I am, I'm actually in, in the process of starting a couple projects, one of which I hope could uh, turn into a book. Um, but first I'm focused on a um, sort of a journalism ethics uh, mm -hmm. video project, which will be online, where I uh, create mini documentaries and, on some news topic and then show um, what I call two skew versions to illustrate mm -hmm. how they could... Um, how you can change things by like lighting and camera angle, mm -hmm. what you cut or don't cut. Say you're mm -hmm. doing accurate journalism, but still, um, but send a completely different message. And um, I call that skew tutor. Um, I don't want it to be attack on journalists um, sure. as much as a illustration for citizen journalists, sure. um, people doing you know their own reporting online and so on. So how did you sort of how did that uh, sort of concern for for being accurate for for being uh, objective. How did that? How did that play into to your work on this book? It, it was really important because I, I feel like if you pick up a nonfiction book, especially one that you expect to be treated journalistically, that um, mm -hmm. as soon as you feel like someone's pushing you one way or the other on an issue that's as heated as immigration, mm -hmm. um, if it doesn't match your viewpoints, you're going to put it down. Mm -hmm. And if that's not really productive because you're kind of preaching to the choir if you know if you're only being read by people that already feel the way you might feel and if you convey some um, <clears throat> some political agenda and and I did have people tell me um, nobody I ended up working with but I had people as I was looking for money for the documentary mm -hmm. um, I think some literary agents that I didn't end up working with saying you, sh you shouldn't do this book unless you have a political goal goal um, but as a journalist I had trouble with that I mean there's room for mm -hmm. those kind of books but I also felt like it's, to me, it's more valuable to let somebody um, <clears throat> read a story and walk away to make their own decisions because you probably end up opening more minds that way to mm -hmm. different viewpoints, and it's, it's more productive in the way I look at it. Did Steve push you towards trying to be more <laughs> Oh, all kinds of pressure. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, he was great. <laughs> no, I did. He, he I understood mean, it, I think. It seemed like some people did want you to, I mean, yeah. if you were doing a talk, like, well, I don't think anyone ever just came out and asked you, what are you, I mean, I've had What's that. your opinion? But I can tell that people wanted to know what yeah. you thought in the end. Like, why didn't you put a chapter in the end? And your, yeah, like how you felt everything happened. But I could tell that you never wanted to do that. Yeah, that really wasn't yeah. the point for you. I ha I had a lot of people. I have had people at some talks. Um, mm -hmm. and one person I remember specifically saying, "I really don't agree with how you handled this. Um, right. Why wouldn't you use this story to, you know, um, get Congress or immigration to do something differently?" And, um, but honestly, I, I don't think people open their minds if they feel like they're being pushed anyway. And, um, and immigration hasn't really changed much, even though everybody lists it as a very high concern every time there's a presidential mm -hmm. election. Not much changes, and mm -hmm. everybody on both sides seems dissatisfied. Um, so yeah, but I, I clearly get people who want to say, well, well, what's your, you know, what do you, what's the answer here? Um, and I tell them, well, if I had the answer, I'd run for Congress <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> instead of writing books. Yeah. But, uh, but it's. Um, but it's really not an easy issue, you know. And if mm -hmm. you, you know, people that have read the book say, "I, 
you know, I feel really strongly this way, but I did see some other issues I hadn't thought about mm -hmm. or just learn things about immigration mm -hmm. that I didn't really understand before. Did, did researching the book influence the way you, you think about immigration issues at all? Did it, did it sort of cause you to, to recognize where there might be problems in, in our current immigration system? Yeah, I did, I did learn more. Um, if you spend time talking to the families and talking to immigration agents, you mm -hmm. really hear different perspectives and, mm -hmm. and from people who know it firsthand, not from politicians who are second or third sources. Mm -hmm. um, and what I, you know, what I hear is, you know, people ask for, for the families, for example, people want to know why don't they just wait and get in line and try to get their mm -hmm. documents. But first of all, it's, you just have to remember the culture there. They might not even be aware of, well, how do I start this process? Um, their neighbors just go. They know the smuggler that takes them. So in their minds, maybe that's the way to do it. Even they probably are aware that it's not legal, but. Um, but that's one thing you learn is that it's just sort of the culture that, mm -hmm. you know, this is how you do it and their neighbors have all done that. Um, yeah. So it feeds on itself. And if you talk to immigration agents, they'll say things like anytime a politician brings up amnesty, you know, thousands more hurry here in hopes that they'll be here when it happens. Mm -hmm. um, so, so in their viewpoint is if you're going to do it, you need to just say it and do it right then because otherwise you're bumping your numbers every time you talk about it. Yeah. Uh, things I hadn't thought about before. That's a really interesting uh, issue. Did you did you have a point you want to make, Steve? It's not totally off track, but it's. Um, I was wondering if while you were doing the book, at any point you ever felt like someone didn't want you to report this story, or didn't, or if you ever faced any resistance from anybody, like because um, you were dealing with government sources. Or and I know that some of the people that you we have pictures of in the book are still wanted, um, yeah. and so I don't know <laughs> if you ever thought to yourself, maybe I don't want to pursue this, or someone got in your way and you just said I'm going to do it anyway, or maybe. No, yeah, I, I'm kind of stubborn and I did have trouble, but I don't think I ever decided I was going to give up um, right. because I, I, there was, there is an exemption because of it being an open case. They have a smuggler, like you mentioned, that was mm -hmm. never, or several that have never been tried in the U.S. or right. um, brought here. Um, one still wanted, and, and as a result, technically you can turn to this exemption for open uh, criminal investigations. But what I found is most of the agencies I worked with realized that enough times passed um, it's probably not going to harm anything to release information. Uh, I did have trouble with several federal agencies that just did not want any part of this, right. um, would not release anything. Um, I think the uh, U.S. Attorney's Office in Texas wouldn't even grant me an interview when we were down mm -hmm. there, um, even just to over, give an overview of the facts. Um, so, so there's that. I, I don't know if that fear of uh, what's this going to be about, um, or you know, just nervousness mm -hmm. um, you get, and 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 I feel like they kind of turn to the, um, this option under the law of denying because it was open. Yeah. Did you, so I, I think immigration has become a, a, a real controversial issue in Iowa, um, even though, it, it, you know, I don't know that people think of Iowa or the Midwest it's sort of on a national scale when they, when they think of sort of the immigration uh, problem. Is it as hot a hot button of an issue in Iowa as it is in Texas as in Arizona? Uh, did you get a sense of that? I feel, I feel like um, people in Iowa, maybe because we, um, or I should say, especially in um, smaller neighborhoods and towns, uh, people tend to get to know one another. And in some very large urban areas, mm -hmm. you might lose that. So, so this, uh, people would expect you might have more um, tension in Iowa. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I remember feeling when I reported some of this for the Des Moines Register mm -hmm. that sometimes the opposite was true. You get to know your neighbors, um, their kids play on the football team with mm -hmm. your kid, they go to church with you. And, um, and you might suspect they're not here legally, but you don't know, and, and uh, at some point they're your friends. And, and so what I found is it's, um, it, you know, sometimes people are surprised that small towns can actually be very um, supportive and open to, um, to the idea that these people are um, maybe not doing something legal, but trying to do what's better for their families. And, and I noticed that when we filmed in Texas, I, um, not because they're not sensitive, but mm -hmm. just because they're used to um, these kind of tragedies happening in the desert and so on. Um, they would say things like, why are you telling this story? It's, you know, it happens all the time. And, not, yeah. and I'm not trying to say again that they're um, unfeeling. It's just that's in their right. news all the time. Maybe not this extent, but, right. you know. They're exposed um, to it more. Yeah. And in Iowa, if it doesn't land in our yard, backyard so often. So they, um, people yeah. tend to remember it and, you know, feel bad about what happened no matter how they feel on the topic. Yeah. I want to I sort of change topics and, and talk briefly about sort of mm -hmm. 
uh, Steve and I have talked about sort of the future of, of book publishing. Um, right. So we're going to have, a, I w I'd like to, to touch on sort of the future of, of newspapers. You know, uh, I think, you know, it, it, it's traveling in, down the same path, I think, in a lot of ways that, that book publishing is and, and that newspaper <laughs> publishers are having a harder time sort of right. making ends meet. Where do you see the future of newspapers? Is, is there always going to be a place for, for newspapers? Well, you know, I, it's, I will say it's really sad to see the changes happening. I left mm -hmm. newspapers about six years ago, and, yeah. and it was right after that that layoffs really started happening. And, um, you know, not all, but some of my friends who are still with newspapers say things like, when I get fired instead of if, <laughs> if I get yeah. fired. And, um, but I do, th I do think that they are searching uh, very hard for some kind of answer, some kind of way to use technology and combine it with what we're doing, or what newspapers are doing mm -hmm. already. And, um, turn that economic model around to maybe find a way to survive. Um, I will say that I think there's some form of that's going to survive because um, as more and more sources of information are out there, um, people are, I think already feel this need for um, who to turn to for good solid information that they can trust and um, it, it is going to evolve some way but I think that journalists will have a role still in, um, in some way. I agree. I mean <clears throat> There's so many. Um, I think it was kind of like the ebooks. Um, I think there's a lot of interest in them because they're new, and there's a lot of interest in this blogging and it's like independent news stuff. But at some point, people are going to pull back and want to know, like, I want to know that I can trust this person. So I see the news, like a news bureau or a news source, as being adding credentials to the story. Yeah. And of course, journalism is not going anywhere. I mean, just like stories, in my opinion. If you start once, if you start saying once upon a time, people want to know what you have to say next. People are always going to want to know what's happening in the world. So the question is how they can continue yeah. that. So it's not a dying field. It's just a, it's just a, uh, a medium in transition. Yeah, right? I I joked with my husband that I uh, don't really choose um, the strongest fields because I was in newspapers <laughs> and I left for the books and now it feels like the same thing's it's happening. Like, <laughs> but I, I think both are going to do well eventually. I mean, find they're going to find their way to um, mm -hmm. fit with tech, change with technology, sure. and make it work eventually. Well, yeah, sure. You, oh, no, I, ask, oh, I was wondering what, because you're in journalism, you wrote the book, and I don't know. I kind I don't know how you <laughs> enjoyed being a book publisher or not. But um, I was just wondering if there's any surprises along the way for oh. you, other than having a bad publisher. But you no. skip that part. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've loved working with you. You know that. I know. I. I uh, I think um, just the pa the part you know the the fact that authors all regardless of whether they're with a small medium or a large publisher have to do a lot of the marketing themselves. I don't I don't think you go into it for that, but it is very clear that that's really important. Yeah. Um, and I've learned a lot, and I've probably been slow at learning, but <laughs> but I'm yeah. kind of getting that that you have to market yourself, which sometimes feels funny, but um, but your book and and um, and work your way through the social media and try to. Um, Try to help spread the word because it's just uh, it's just what you know every author needs to do if they really want to um, help their book along and share the story. Was that a, was that a challenge for you, like trying to sort of put yourself out there as opposed to just you know I am a reporter for the for the Des Moines Register and that yeah that's enough. I agree. I mean, it really was because uh, because I'd always been behind another name, you know, mm -hmm. the St. Louis Post Dispatch or the Des Moines Register. And, and all of a sudden my, well, other than being with a publisher, your name is sort of your business. Mm -hmm. and, and especially as you move on to other projects um, and, you know, and feeling okay with sort of promoting your business, which is your name, yeah. you know, it feels funny at first, especially when a lot of your social media is your friends and you don't want to feel like you're pestering them, but it's, yeah. but well, you it's, also don't want to, you know, yeah. fail to share the story because yeah. you're um, feeling funny about that. Well, she is not alone. Um, that's one thing I notice from publish. I mean, from authors, is um, I think that I, I try and tell them a few times before we get started that it's just going to be me and them. But I still think, and it's not a knock against any author, but it's a big shock to yeah. like suddenly realize that um, you're sort of on the out there on your own. And I think it's a shock because, I mean, three of us are probably old enough to remember the heyday when there were readings and you just in your mind you think that there's just the authors show up the halls packed because Harper's paid for a big tour which is yeah. how it used to be but I just know from being around um, other bigger publishers that it's just it's really gotten there's just not that much money out there and so the authors are really having to um, pick up 
and promote themselves, which I would be uncomfortable doing too if I were in their shoes. Yeah. I mean, sure. it's, a, it's definitely a transition time right now for that sort of thing. And I mean, like finally Colleen's book is a um, e-book or a Kindle now. And so things like that, we probably, should, I probably should have been more open to that at the beginning. Yeah. But Nick has watched the progression of me go from hating those things to like, <laughs> wow, those things are awesome. <laughs> Well, Colleen, thank you for coming by and, and promoting yourself and your book today. <laughs> um, thank you. And, and I hope uh, you, you're speaking at Prairie Lights tonight. That's tomorrow night. Tomorrow, tomorrow night. And uh, I hope that goes well for you. And I think she has a new website. You want to tell me your website? Yeah. Well, and my, uh, my author site is Colleen, <laughs> Colleen Bradford, Kranz.com. But I'm, I've started um, the, my two new projects, BickerBattles.com um, and SkewTutor.com is coming in the summer. Very cool. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for joining us again for Tollcorn Books, and we hope to see you again uh, next time.